Could they have made the break longer? I know he wanted more ponies, but oh my god, that wasn't long enough. <laughs> I had stuff I needed to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so much for working on a buffer. We're now back to having to record every week. <laughs> Speaking of which, hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on My Little Pony, French Biz Magic, Season 6, Episode 1 and 2. The Crystalline. Quick note here, I love how when we were talking about this yesterday, you went, Season 6? Already? <laughs> well, I only own up to Season 4, so there's obviously something wrong here. <laughs> it was a pretty decent start to the season. Very, I would say, normal for an LP uh, season start. Not the best, not the worst, right somewhere in the middle. <laughs> mm, but different from most season starters in that we did not have an actual specific villain. I don't count the weather as a villain. Oh, yeah, you're right. There is no villain. Though I do like the um, refinement of a couple of characters, Starlight Glimmer and Sunburst. Sunburst seems to be a new fan favorite. <laughs> well, we don't have that many male ponies. And here we have one, you know, who is another of Celestia's students and, you know, has history with another character. So the shipping possibilities, my... God, my Celestia. Ah... <laughs> uh... Speaking of Celestia, hey, they weren't useless or shunned off into the background. Well, they were shunned off into the background, but they weren't useless being shunned off into the background in some kind of contrived, oh, we have to get rid of the princesses. <laughs> no, they were actually useful and actively doing something and working together, all of which was great. But they were still shoved into the background and ultimately not part of the final solution. Uh, though that suddenly reminded me of the great introduction of Shining Armor. Oh, hey, how about, uh, hi. <laughs> Babies are a lot harder to take care of than I thought. Now, that's the usual answer for most people. <laughs> yeah. And then when you top off that your lovely little foal is an alicorn, with all that implies. <laughs> and we thought Pinkie Pie had it bad in baby cakes. <laughs> and speaking of baby alicorns, I like how they kind of just Gloss over that with a little bit of, uh, what the princesses say, though what the princesses say could be interpreted in different ways. I mainly interpret it as, yeah, this, um, powerful being called Hasbro insisted on another alicorn princess. <laughs> but in what we have for canon inside that world, you could actually interpret it as not the princesses saying that uh, alicorn hasn't been born before, but that... It hasn't been born in this way before. Because who says Celestia and Luna were actually born as alicorns? They could have been just created as alicorns. I know that sounds like a weird distinction, but there's actually a big distinction because just because you're born, yes, you are created from that. But who says Celestia and Luna couldn't have been just created out of nothing as alicorns? Yes. So my interpretation of this is that no alicorn has ever come from the communion of stallion and mare. Mm -hmm. Especially when the stallions is just a unicorn. <laughs> well, considering that we haven't seen any alicorn stallions, excluding the dream sequence. <laughs> <laughs> Princess Big Mac for the win. <sighs> Myself, I actually enjoyed the second part of this two-parter more than the first part, because as usual, the first part is usually, we're setting up everything. Look at us set up everything. Look at us set up everything. Oh, look at these awkward moments between these two characters, which are obviously awkward for plot reasons. <laughs> I'm talking about Starlight, Glimmer, and Sunburst here. <laughs> Yes, but I'm letting you go first because I, I'm going to nitpick and that'll take up most of the podcast. <laughs> Good point there. I had to keep pausing during a lot of those scenes because like, I know where this is going and I'm feeling embarrassed for the characters and oy. also I love how Twilight Sparkle's like, this is how you give a lesson about friendship. Here's a list. Follow the list. And that's not how it works. And she didn't really do much teaching and how she felt like, though Spike does give her a little bit of boost at the end by going, isn't that what Celestia does? I'm like, well, not as bad as Twilight, but kind of, yeah. <laughs> Except that Celestia does it 
intentionally and with more knowledge at her disposal. Twilight just shirked her role as teacher for the, oh yeah, let's keep the Empire from being destroyed. Which is definitely important, but she doesn't really know how to be a teacher yet. And if she just looked back on how she learned her friendship lessons, she would get rid of the lists. <laughs> Especially since Starlight Glimmer seems to be another one of those different learners compared to the way Twilight learns. Especially since you see the contrast between Starlight Glimmer and Sunburst. Sunburst is study without the actual ability to perform what he studies. And Starlight Glimmer is being able to perform what she studies, but she's not much of a studier. Or she can't really absorb what she's studied. Because, you know, going back to the season 5 opener... You know, she was all like, I couldn't master that spell, how could you? A couple of quick notes on some voice stuff near the end of part two. Specifically, Mr. and Mrs. Sparkle, as they're called in the credits, are actually voiced. Mrs. Sparkle is voiced by Tara Strong, Twilight Sparkle. And Mr. Sparkle is voiced by, I can't pronounce his name right now, but the guy who voices Shining Armor. Oh, Delando. That's still so creepy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, though I am looking forward to the new dub. Uh, Esco Flone, if you weren't following. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. MLP is already in English. Dot, dot, dot. Ding, Esco Flone, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like jump tracks there a little bit. <laughs> and you're like, uh -uh. oh, I know where I am now. <laughs> That's pretty much everything I can think of right now. We can go straight into your nitpicks, and of course I'll probably think of stuff along the way. <laughs> As it jars your memory. Okay, starting with the title, The Crystalling. I was really hoping that was going to be some sort of creature, rather than a take on the word christening, especially since the seasons usually open with a new villain. Yay that we got travel, which is something we said we wanted in season six, but it was back to the Crystal Empire yet again. This is like, what, our third or fourth time going to the Crystal Empire? The creation of it, yeah, not the creation, the resurrection of it, the choosing of it for the Equestria games, and the actual Equestria games. I think we've gone there almost as often as we've gone to Canterlot. <laughs> that reminds me, I love how Starlight Glimmer attempts to use Spike's fame to get out of going to see Sunburst. <laughs> yes. And considering that Spike was originally more on her side, could have been just a tiny bit more understanding. And I know it was for humor, but really, she can't find her way around Twilight's castle. Yes, I know it was a place to fit in Doctor Who joke and to do something very Scooby-Doo of a freaking million doors. But I'm sorry, some of those doors should have been locked. Spike, you have claws. You are... More dexterous than a pony. Lock the door, damn it. Speaking of uh, Spike, they fit in another reference in there from, let's see, one of my favorite episodes where Pinkie Pie goes a little crazy, where she's questioning Spike, and she goes, tell me, and he goes, okay, sometimes I stand in front of the mirror and flex my arms and do this. <laughs> because Starlight caught him flexing his, his arms in the mirror. Also, after Spike comes up with the idea where he should go off and take the list, and since, you know, the list is basically instructions on how to do it, the moment that happens, like, oh, this is going to be like a mini Spike episode, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, that's not the kind of task based on previous Spike experiences I would let Spike do. He's going to mess up somewhere. <laughs> like, we have to stay with the list. I can't believe we almost skipped over the part about making sure it's important. <laughs> yes. Because that was so important to, you know, ramp up the anticipation of how important this meeting is. And since we're right outside of Sunburst's home right now, when and how did he get to the Crystal Empire? It hasn't been back in Equestria for that long. So why would he choose to go there? Except I guess it's one of those places where no pony knows your name. That's what I was thinking. Also, he may have finished reading all the libraries he had access to in Canterlot, because I have a feeling that's probably where he was up until he moved to the Crystal Empire. Good chance. Good chance. I love, though, that even though he's not a wizard, he had the whole wizard robe thing going. Mm-hmm. Oh, robes are kind of comfortable. 
Yes, but it doesn't really snow in the Crystal Empire, and the MLP world is a clothing optional world, so not necessary. I like the little detail of the pin that's holding his cloak on is actually his cutie mark. That was a nice touch. But it was hard there because that section of the story was so predictable. You know, he's not a great wizard, it's awkward, they both have things they don't want to tell each other, and he's going to end up having the information that they need because we established with Starlight's flashback that he's an awesome researcher. So he's going to have the answer they need because he's already done all the research and he's just going to be able to put his hooves on it. Though I thought he was going to know the spell and use the spell to fix the book and then they could use the book instead of just relying on the fact that Twilight tried to recreate the spell from memory. And since it failed and Sunburst said that it wouldn't have worked anyways, we don't know if she actually copied out the spell correctly or not. Not copied out, but remembered the spell correctly. Because according to Sunburst, the spell wouldn't have worked anyways. Well, I think he specifically said that it wouldn't have worked anyways, and then he reiterates that it wouldn't have worked by itself. And then he brings up all these other spells you have to be used in combination with it. Yeah, because it takes a combination of spells to do something that complicated. And if the Crystal Empire needs the Crystal Heart to make it habitable, how did anyone ever decide to found the Crystal Empire out there in the frozen north to begin with? Wouldn't it have just been easier to live somewhere that, I don't know, you could actually live? <laughs> Instead of creating a magical relic to protect you? I'm thinking the magical relic is more of a natural thing that occurred over a period of time and people eventually gathered around it, which eventually made it stronger, which eventually made it habitable there. Well, maybe we'll find out more later, but that whole plunging the shard into the crystal heart, that is very Ice Queen fairy tale, only without the dark side of it. Hmm. So, why nitpicks? Yes, more on the whole crystalline ceremony. Were they only bowing because Flurry Heart is actually a royal, or do you bow with every crystalline because the power didn't start flowing to the to be gathered up by the crystal shard until they all bowed? Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about like, oh, they're bowing. I'm not quite sure why. Because she's a princess, but that shouldn't be part of a normal crystalline ceremony because. It's a normal child, not a princess of the blood. Which, by the way, Flurry Heart is a princess on two counts. One, she was born royal, and two, she's an alicorn. Also, do they have a big ceremony like this for every birth in the Crystal Empire, or just when it's a royal birth? Because they mention that crystallings happen normal births as well, but I don't know if it's a big ceremony like this or not. Or do the princes just come by, I bless your child, I bless your child, I bless your child. No, because they wouldn't tote the crystal heart around, so it still has to be the full ceremony for all of them. If you remember how Spike told it on that urn, nice touch, that every new birth was celebrated with the crystalline. That's a whole lot of crystallings. Well, how often is there a birth? Because apparently Flurry Heart is the first one since the return of the Crystal Empire. But... I'm thinking based on statistics, there's probably at least a birth there every day or so based on, you know, just the human world, even though we have a higher population and everything. <laughs> yeah, first you have to figure the Crystal Empire is probably a smaller population. Two, how many of them are mated couples? Three, what is the gestation period? And four, plot armor. You know, most ponies are probably incapable of getting pregnant due to plot armor. If it doesn't serve the story, it doesn't happen. I think the term you actually want to use is plot convenience. Plot armor is to protect a character from dying because they're important to the plot. Fine. So, <laughs> <laughs> the children, are if they are not a plot device, are not going to occur. So, most couples, if we even have established couples, because unless the characters come into the forefront, why are we bothering to establish that they're a couple? Mm-hmm. So yeah, many valid points. Please continue if you have more. <laughs> and the if the position of Crystaller is so important, it apparently seems to be the equivalent of godparent. So Shiny Armor was originally going to ask Twilight, 
but it sounds like the crystaller is supposed to be an important part of the child's life. Twilight's not going to be around enough to do that, so Shining Armor shouldn't have been picking his sister for this in the first place. And then the second place, you pick some guy you just met, and by the rules of your kingdom, bind him to an important role in your child's life? Well, I think he was okay with it for many reasons, mostly for plot convenience, but Celestia and... No, well, mostly just Celestia kind of vouched for him at one point, so... <laughs> Yeah, but let's not forget Sunset Shimmer was also a former student. Being a former student does not necessarily mean much. Also, there were five other members of the main six right there. If you're not going to ask your sister, wouldn't you ask one of your sister's best friends before you go and ask a total stranger? I love the points you bring up. It's such a contrast to me, like, oh yeah, this is good. I like these parts. <laughs> and... If the frozen north coming in was so dangerous, where the heck was Rainbow Power? They have not... Not that I really <laughs> want to see the ridiculous manes and the overcoloring ever again. But if it was that dangerous, why weren't we accessing Rainbow Power? You know, that can blast too, instead of just having the two highest ranked Alicorn princesses out there blasting. Why not have the other members of the main six out there blasting as well. <laughs> Maybe as they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> or those toys didn't sell well enough, so let's not bring that up ever again. <laughs> ah. So, what did you think of the new princess's name? Uh, it was cute, and not so cutesy that it's going to be something she's going to hate when she's older. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the disparity among naming norms and protocol in the MLP universe because Pinkie Pie, you know, all her siblings are also Pie, you know, like it's a last name. But in the Apple family, you're all types of apples. Apple is not a last name. But with Mr. and Mrs. Cake, their children have cake like it's a last name. If you look at Twilight and Shining, if you take their name as we address them as full names, they have different last names, which if Twilight and Shining's parents are called Mr. and Mrs. Sparkle in the credits, would mean that their last name of the family is actually Sparkle. Mm -hmm. And then there's the um, people without last names like Rarity and Sweetie Belle and Scootaloo if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Assuming that having a two-part name actually is a last name. Because it is for Pinkie Pie and family, and it is for Mr. and Mrs. Cake and Pound and Pumpkin, but we don't have evidence of that occurring in other ones. Hmm. I love how I went into a mildly deep discussion of name theory. <laughs> <laughs> I should say MLP name theory. <laughs> yes, but if Twilight and Shining's parents are Mr. and Mrs. Sparkle, then technically shouldn't Shining Armor's full air quotes, legal name be Shining Armor Sparkle. <laughs> Sorry. I was just like, wow, that sounds like a magical girl attack. <laughs> it, it really does. <laughs> Shining Armor Sparkle. Sorry. I just imagined one of the cute high Earth Defense Club love people <laughs> using an attack like that. Sounds about right. Uh, there's a new season I can't wait for. Mm-hmm. Yes, and we also have Sailor Moon to look forward to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Too many shows. God, I hope they don't all come on at the same time. Because we only have so much time to do podcast recordings and MLPs like every week. So. Yes, but Sailor Moon is only one recording a month. And if we do Cute High Earth Defense Club Love like we did last time, it'll only be two recordings. First half, second half. Mm-hmm. Ah. <sighs> So is it about time to wrap things up? Mm-hmm. Ah, well, I thought this was a nice episode overall. It was a good season opener. Like I said, it's not the best. It's not the worst. It's somewhere in the middle. I like the second part more than the first part. Sunburst is a nice character. I do hope we see more of him. I hope Starlight gets more character development to make her less of that, we did quick redemption. Oh, wait. Damn. Uh. <laughs> Let's fix this, shall we? And... Overall, there's been some, like, 
usual plot inconsistencies, I enjoyed it and uh, can't wait to see the next episodes of the season. And now I need to get drawing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I did enjoy this episode. It was a nice break that we didn't start the season with an actual villain, even though we still had a crisis and we still had something that needed the involvement of the princesses. We didn't set ourselves up with a season villain. So are we even going to have a season villain? Or are we going to have one-shot villains or no villains? Because plenty of Slice of Life episodes fit the theme as well as combative villainous ones you know and also villainous fighting you know magical girl type stuff as opposed to villainous you're ruining our friendship you fiend <laughs> or i would have won if it wasn't for you dang kids and your dragon <laughs> <laughs> uh though it does sound like we're gonna be doing actual globe trotting this time in this season from little bits of information i've picked up from stuff i couldn't help avoid but read because it was posted in the chat i was like ah you put that in the spoiler section why did i click on the spoiler section <laughs> Because you're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> well, I hope you've enjoyed... Oh, were you done, by the way? Mm, I think my only other thing was, okay, I know Flurry Heart's an alicorn, but really, one scream and the crystal heart shatters. Do you know how much that thing survived? <laughs> All I could think when that scream happened was, um, are we going to see a magical girl transformation where she goes... In the name of the moon, I will punish you? Okay. <laughs> well, I hope you've enjoyed our thoughts on My Little Pony, French Biz Magic, Season 6, Episode 1 and 2, The Crystalline. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing and or leaving a friendly comment below. Want to know more of what's going on? You can check Lux out on Tumblr and DeviantArt. Really like Lux's art? and would like some high quality versions or maybe some of your own, he is currently accepting commissions and also has a Patreon. All links in the description.